Uh, we are now in a good position to turn to uh, hearing two different points of view on the potential risks and the potential benefits of gain-of-function research. Our first speaker is Yoshihiro Kawaoka, who is uh, going to speak to us about the key issues on benefits that need to be considered in assessments of the NIH in its current uh, program of deliberative assessment. Yoshi, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, first, I'm going to uh, review types of gain of function research that we've been discussing in the previous session. <clears throat> um, I think there are three types of uh, gain of function research. <clears throat> gain of function research resulting in the generation of viruses first, do not exist in nature. For example, H5N1 viruses that are airborne transmissible in fats. And this may be more inclusive than uh, what uh, David Redman stated. I really like the, your, your uh, categorization of the uh, important you know, research. So this type of research is very few. And the second uh, type of gain of function research is a generation of viruses that are more pathogenic and or transmissible than the starting viruses, but still comparable to or less pathogenic and or transmissible than those existing in nature. And there are many, uh, the example is the low pathogenic H5N1 viruses with mutations found in natural isolates that improve uh, the replication in mammalian cells. And there are many uh, type of uh, experiments like this. And the third category is the um, generation of viruses that are more pathogenic and or transmissible than the starting viruses in animal models, but do not appear to be a major public health concern. Example is the high growth PR8 uh, virus, which is a vaccine backbone virus with increased pathogenicity in mice. And there are many of these kind of experiments. So in my presentation, I'm going to focus on the first category. And for, uh, in my presentation, I will call it gain of function research of concern. So in my presentation uh, today, uh, I'm going to discuss why we need gain of function research. And I'm going to discuss the benefits of gain of function research, uh, specific examples, and conceptual justification. So first, I'm going to discuss the risks of gain of function research of concern. So why, uh, why are we concerned? So um, Simon uh, Wayne Hobson states that the, while the probability of an accidental or deliberate release of a human transmissible virus from a single lab is small, but not zero, the more groups performing gain of function virology, the greater the overall risk. And the generation of viruses through gain of function research in labs with low level containment facility or scrutiny uh, increases the risk of accidental release. And the risks are finite and small, but, the, uh, but of catastrophic uh, properties if ever there was a breakdown of biosafety or biosecurity. So these are the concerns. Uh, what about the alternatives to um, gain of function research of concern? Um, Mark Lipsitz uh, states that alternative scientific approaches are not only less risky, but also more likely to generate uh, results that can be readily translated into public health, public benefits. I can think of three types of uh, alternatives. First one is the loss of function research. The second, the use of low pathogenicity viruses. Third, phenotypic analysis. Now, loss of function research does not always provide answers. I'm going to show you an example. 1918 virus transmits in ferrets. 
Every time we performed lots of function studies, generated a mutant 1918 virus that does not transmit in ferrets. By doing this experiment, he was able to identify the specific mutation that alter receptor specificity and no longer transmit in, in ferrets. Now, many people have done the experiments with virus uh, with the wild type H5HA, and these viruses do not transmit in ferrets. Now, Ron Fouché and our group performed experiments by introducing mutations or generating the virus with additional mutations. <clears throat> and these mutant uh, H5N1 viruses now transmit in ferrets. Now, new phenotype, in this case, HA stability, required for ferret transmission was identified by gain of function research, but not by loss of function research. Now, use of low pathogenicity viruses. Now, highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses and low pathogenic influenza viruses are different uh, in virus replication. <coughs> um, the highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses cause systemic infection, uh, grows even in the brain. Low pathogenic influenza viruses cause only localized infection. And when you infect mice with either uh, H5N1 highly pathogenic virus or uh, seasonal influenza virus, the replication is substantially different. Y-axis indicates virus titer in lung, and X-axis indicates time after infection. Um, H5N1 viruses replicate 100-fold better than the seasonal H1N1 virus. So the highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses differ from low pathogenic viruses in their kinetics of virus replication and tissue tropism. So the data obtained with low pathogenic viruses can be misleading because we're talking about two different viruses that differ in virus replication hundredfold. However, as we heard, um, there's a paper describing the use of microRNA to attenuate the virus. So if after careful examination, the attenuated viruses uh, behave exactly the same way as the wild type highly pathogenic viruses, this would be a uh, promising uh, approach. Now, phenotypic analysis. <clears throat> Uh, I borrowed this table from uh, Mark Lipsitz's uh, publication, describing safer approaches to studying human adaptation of influenza A viruses. And this include um, modeling, receptor specificity fusion assays, replication complex assays, sequence comparison, sequence and phenotypic comparison of natural isolates, the use of seasonal influenza viruses for transmission and studying host factors. The alternative approaches alone do not provide answers to key questions. For example, none of these alternative approaches revealed transmissibility of H5N1 viruses in ferrets. And the data obtained using alternative approaches do not always correlate with data obtained from gain-of-function experiments using viruses. So we cannot rely solely on alternative approaches. The phenotypically new traits and the molecular basis for the, those traits have been identified by gain of function research of concern, but not by alternative approaches. The benefits of uh, gain of function research of concern, uh, David Redman states that the, the benefit of this work to public health uh, is unclear. And uh, some states, the vaccine makers consider there's little in this influenza gain of function research that will help them develop more effective vaccines. 
and there's nothing in gain of function uh, virology that will help us predict a pandemic or help us develop new, more effective vaccines. I think uh, specific benefits differ depending on the gain of function research of concern. So I'm going to discuss what we learned from the ferret transmission H5N1 gain of function research. First, I'm going to discuss the vaccine stockpile. <clears throat> this is the uh, H5N1 vaccine stockpiling in Japan. The Japan started vaccine stockpiling for H5N1 since 2005. Now, these um, vaccines are um, drop titers, so the, um, they ex expire, and the, some of these vaccines have been discarded. So in Japan, Japan spent um, nearly 600 million U.S. dollars uh, for this stockpiling, and U.S. 1 billion U.S. dollars have been spent. But as I described, these vaccines expire, so uh, have been replenished. And for uh, 10 million people, uh, vaccines for H5N1 um, virus, uh, each lot costs 74 million US dollars to replenish. So with, with this in mind, it has been 17 years since the emergence of H5N1 viruses, yet they have not caused a pandemic. Some questioned um, pandemic potential of H5N1 viruses, but with Ron Fouché's data and our data, now this, this is no longer the case. So the uh, H5N1 vaccine stockpiles are in, uh, needed. And this information is important for policymakers, specifically, especially that the, these vaccines need to be um, replenished. The strain selection for stockpiling vaccines, uh, stockpile vaccines. There are 26 H5N1 vaccine candidates and four more in preparation. How do we select one? There are antigenically different H5N1 viruses circulating in nature. And with this information, we now know which H5N1 viruses have pandemic potential. So this is a useful information for vaccine candidate selection. Because vaccine would ideally be produced by uh, using a virus that is closely related to viruses of high pandemic potential. So policy makers, not vaccine companies, select vaccine strains. So naturally, vaccine companies will say no when asked if gain of function research of concern has helped vaccine production, because these gain of function research of concern do not uh, increase pro, um, the efficiency of virus production. The risk assessment of circulating strains. The uh, Ron Fouché and our group identified four mutations to be important for transmissibility of these viruses in ferrets. Among these four mutations, these two mutations, <coughs> they're different, but the result is the same, loss of carbohydrate at this site. And when you look at the viruses in nature, there are viruses with this mutation already circulating, and they appear to be increasing over years. And also, when you look at the H5N1 viruses in Egypt, where we have many human cases, in birds, there are two types of viruses, the H5N1 viruses with this particular mutation and the other lacking this mutation. But when you look at H5N1 viruses isolated in Egypt um, in, from humans, they all have this mutation. And when you look at the viruses, see virus sequences, you can tell these are not the viruses that are transmitted to humans, 
Rather, these are the viruses that are transmitted to humans, suggesting the virus with this mutation may be more transmissible to humans. Some said surveillance of H5N1 viruses uh, is limited, so this kind of information is not useful. But this is changing. Um, this winter, the H5N1 viruses have been isolated from healthy wild waterfowl and been sequenced, and this information now available. And also, with this kind of analysis, it's, it is difficult for me to say this kind of information is not important. So again, the specific benefits differ depending on the gain-of-function research of concern. But gain-of-function research of concern allows us to obtain information that we could not obtain by other methods unless it actually occurred in nature, such as the droplet transmissible H5N1 and other avian viruses to which humans do lack immunity. So the gain-of-function research of concern allows us to determine whether these viruses could emerge. If so, it also allows us to examine the mechanisms for such events. So the information obtained is essential for pandemic preparation. So what are the key issues on benefits that need to be addressed in the assessments uh, the NIH will undertake? This is the question that I'm supposed to address. I think we need to focus on gain-of-function research of concern. And we should recognize that for some questions, only gain-of-function research of concern can provide accurate answers. And finally, uh, we need to obtain consensus from the community to per per uh, perform gain-of-function research of concern. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, if you uh, If you'd like, you could stay here or you could uh, return. Oh, oh. you wait. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, now my pleasure to invite David Relman to the podium, who will speak on key issues about risks and the need to address them in the assessment that the NIH will undertake. David, welcome. Thank you, Harvey. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, as you've heard, I was asked to address issues related to risks. Uh, so I thought I would make uh, some further comments on issues that have already been raised with respect to what it is um, that we're most concerned about um, and, and try to get at greater degrees of specificity. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about alternative approaches, but then step back and talk about a few larger issues. And these you may view as perhaps um, uh, more or less relevant to the charge at hand for this National Academies Committee, but I view them as really critical. That has to do with um, where the science and technology is headed now over time, what this means about the global distribution of risks and benefits. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, about settings in which misuse might occur and then talk about uh, moral and ethical responsibilities uh, before ending with a few suggestions for um, steps that might help us move forward. Um, let me start by saying I think we agree on a lot of, of points here, both this morning and, uh, and within the larger scientific community. I, I think we do need greater clarity and specificity and precision in what it is that we're, we're most concerned about. I would suggest that it is certain combinations of properties um, of a sort that relate to pathogenicity, high degrees of pathogenicity, and high degrees of transmissibility, perhaps with or without properties that would allow this same infectious agent to be um, uh, uh, impervious to countermeasures that are currently available. Um, I also think there's a big difference between uh, deliberately creating agents with these combinations of properties that we believe do not exist in nature as opposed to understanding properties that have arisen 
um, or particular viruses that have arisen. And I, I certainly take to heart comments that have been made about the importance of being proactive, and I absolutely ascribe to the importance of being proactive and doing good science, and I, I'd like to, to address that briefly as well. Um, again, for the point of clarity, of course, gain of function uh, can result from knockout uh, mutations. So we are talking about uh, properties and not um, experimental approaches per se. Some have said that, that much if not all of the science that we're talking about um, may not be, have anticipatable results, but in fact, very often we apply very powerful selective uh, uh, conditions and uh, screens that can be uh, reasonably anticipated to yield agents with uh, the properties that these um, selective conditions and screens are meant to, uh, to identify. And so I think we, we want to be focused upon work that, that ha is both deliberate and can be reasonably anticipated to, to have these properties. And this is just an example of where from bacteriology, an unanticipated result occurred from a knockout approach resulting in gain of function, hypervirulence in mycobacterium tuberculosis. So again, just a, a, another plea for greater clarity and specificity. Why are we concerned, and I think Yoshi um, made some very good uh, distinguishing comments and framing comments about um, how to think about these <laughs> categories of experiments, but we are talking about the possibility of creating an agent that has, again, properties that I think all of us would, would want to be concerned about. High degrees of pathogenicity, high degrees of transmissibility, perhaps with other properties in the same agent that does not currently exist and may not exist in nature. Um, why are these consequential? Well, because we may not have, in fact, in some cases do not have adequate countermeasures available currently to, uh, to thwart and contain uh, these agents, nor do we have them in places where the information might be used to, per, to create the same kinds of risks. Is there a risk in not doing an experiment? Of course there is. Um, the question is, how large are they, and are there ways of trying to um, both anticipate and address that concern? I would argue that in almost every case, there are um, other experimental approaches that will provide the knowledge that we agree is critical and many of the benefits that we agree we must have without necessarily undertaking this very, very small subset of experiments that create these specific agents with all of these combined properties. These alternative approaches include knockout approaches, alternative gain of function, experiments, but in altered genetic backgrounds, um, as well as much more aggressive surveys of nature. Now, I completely accept that there may be circumstances when these approaches do not yield what has been learned from these more concerning, risky gain-of-function experiments, and I think Yoshi very uh, clearly um, described those. But the question is, is that loss of, of specific information worth the risk? Um, the, the example that Yoshi gave was the failure to learn what might enhance transmissibility in ferrets. That isn't necessarily the information that would help us understand exactly what generates and enhances transmissibility in humans. There are uncertainties in those results, just as there are uncertainties in the results of these alternative approaches. There's always uncertainty in whether or not the results are truly relevant to the circumstance that we most wish to understand. I would just make a plea that we have not undertaken the kind of aggressive, deliberate, and thoughtful surveys of nature and triangulation of, of, of uh, evolutionary paths in nature that we ought to be doing, and then the study of the mutants that we know are, are occurring. Individual mutations, yes, but combinations have not been, I think, adequately um, studied and understood from that perspective. Now, what about over time? Over time, this wonderful technology that Peter Palese um, revealed in 1990 is of course, importantly, and thankfully, becoming ever more easy to undertake. More efficient, 
less expensive. Um, you could ask, well, what does that mean about today? How many people can take, download a sequence of an influenza virus and remake through reverse genetics that virus in their laboratory? I don't think any of us can answer that question with any great precision. But what I would argue, and I will in a subsequent slide, is that whatever the number of people that might be today, this number will be larger tomorrow and will be larger still in one week, one month, one year, et cetera. Again, this is a good thing but it has consequences and implications. It's not just that the information is now digital and of digital form, but its procedures are now digitized and rendered into uh, protocols that can be uploaded to robots, to, um, to companies that will do research for money um, of whatever uh, type and specificity you indicate in your, in your experimental protocol. These are companies that are emerging today. They certainly exist where I live, out in Silicon Valley. Um, and this is one, for example, into which you can upload a scripts for a series of deliberate molecular biology experiments with reagents that will all be uh, derived and, and executed remotely. So what does this mean? This means that when we talk about risk and benefit, we cannot simply talk about risk and benefit at the site of the origin of the original information or at the site at which the original experiment takes place. This is not just a question of biosafety. This means that the work is a distributed effort across the globe, and I would suggest that many, many people who are interested in this work for a whole wide variety of reasons, some of which some of us may not fathom, are not represented in this room. They are not here, nor have they been so far in discussions about both benefits and risk, and they need to be. This is a very different world that we are living in and is becoming. And that means, again, to make the point clear, governance and oversight has to be distributed in the very same fashion that is the capability becoming distributed. Um, and, and I think that's something that we're not very good at doing right now. Scaling governance is nothing, um, is not something that we know how to do well. So if you accept the premise that risks are quite rapidly distributed, that's the nature of the information we're talking about, we want the information widely distributed, well then what about the benefits? Shouldn't they also be immediately uh, distributed and made uh, immediately available to all of those who are now affected by these distributed risks? And so I would argue that when we talk about benefits from this work, and clearly there are benefits, they must be um, similarly um, potent and immediately available to all. We can't simply talk about benefits that may be realized next year or may be realized once we have a better surveillance system or when we have a better understanding and we've done 100 more of these experiments because the risk exists today. And if the benefit does not, then we have bought ourselves a period of, of vulnerability. So. Again, I just want to make clear, I'm really talking about a very, very, very small set of experiments that, um, that result in these combinations of properties in, in these particular agents, particular backgrounds that don't exist right now. We have focused on the one hand sometimes on deliberate misuse, which I think is entirely a plausible scenario in today's world, and we'd be crazy not to accept that there are people willing to do um, irresponsible, if not deliberately mischievous acts, but we're also talking about callous disregard, accidental or benign neglect of, of proper procedures and um, mindfulness. And so again, we're talking about safety and security. I won't belabor this, but I, I just want to make the point that again, it's not just in the rarefied atmosphere or setting of the National Academies uh, or the NIH that we have motivations in the life sciences. It's not just a quest for knowledge or a quest to want to help people. There are many people who are now undertaking life sciences research who are just curious. And again, that's, that's fine. Um, some are interested in fame. Again, not necessarily a bad thing. There are people who are interested in fortune and economic benefit. Again, a very good thing. But this creates very different kinds of motivations and, and means that we're talking about very, very different kinds of people who want to do 
this very kind of science that we're talking about. This is a picture from a convention of the International uh, Biotechnology uh, Industry Organization. It was three years ago here in Washington, D.C. I will just point out that here's their, their statement, their mission statement. Our only agenda is the success of the industry. This is, this is an important driver of why science is being done today. And it means that we have not only very different kinds of motivation, but different kinds of people, all of whom have increasing degrees of capability. Again, probably a very, very good thing, but something that has serious implications for how we talk about risk. So it's individuals or small groups that have, may have a whole variety of purposes and backgrounds and worldviews that now may have the same kinds of capabilities that we're talking about. If not today, then tomorrow and next year. By the time that anything is written that comes from this, the world will be a different place already. So where, whatever the degree to which you think there is an overlap between um, this one world of capable individuals and this other world of people who are ill-intended or irresponsible, whatever you think the size, if any, of this today, I would argue that it will only be bigger tomorrow. So, just a few comments about moral and ethical principles. We all have an obligation to think about public beneficence, which means maximizing benefits, minimizing harm. We have a responsibility to be good stewards of the ecosphere, of the planet. That means the betterment of all, and especially, when you talk about justice, those without representation, not just those without representation in this room, but those who don't have necessarily access to the same kinds of routine public health that we have. We can vaccinate ourselves very easily or much more easily than we can see to it that all of those who are facing the exact same risks as we are also are able to be vaccinated. We have, I think, an important dedication and commitment to intellectual freedom and responsibility, and the two go hand in hand. We also, I think, have to believe in a democratic and deliberative process. We've talked about that already this morning. And in the global distribution of both benefits and burdens. And I think this is all because the science that we're talking about is not basic in isolation. In fact, you could argue that there is no such thing as truly pure basic research today in this world. It's funded by the public and it always has some application that might take it across that previously bright line that people like to believe in philosophically that distinguish basic and applied. So we have to talk about the common good. And I think we also have to ask that all of us and our colleagues spend as Joseph Rotblatt said, just a little bit of time thinking about the consequences of our work. We have to. It's our obligation to society. So it leads us to a few questions. Are there any experiments that ought not to be undertaken because the risks out outweigh the benefits or because the benefits will only be realized in the indefinite future? I think the answer is clear. It's yes. There are some experiments. And if we can come to some reasonable agreement that there is something, then I think we can triangulate in on exactly what that might be, how we should define it carefully today, and be mindful that those definitions may have to be altered very quickly. Here's something else I think we ought to be able to agree on, I hope. What's the nature of our moral and ethical social contract uh, with the rest of society? It's profound. We cannot simply talk around it or is, as if it doesn't exist. So many, in fact, Mark Yarborough just recently in Hanover spoke, I thought very uh, articulately about this problem of how do we generate the kinds of the levels of trust that high risk science demands? Well, we need very high standards for accountability. We need a participatory and iterative process. We need safe places for open discussion. I'm not sure that those places can be necessarily found at the homes of those that whose mission is to fund this work. Likewise, nor can it be at the home of those whose job it is to restrict and think only about security. This, in fact, would be a more appropriate, in my view, neutral, safe place for discussions of this sort, uh, and decision-making, perhaps, as well. Uh, 
I just would suggest that you take a look at this report. Um, I recently discovered it. I think it has some really important points. It was a report out of UNESCO, United Nations uh, Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. It was entitled The Precautionary Principle. Before you say, oh my God, let's not go down that road, please understand that in this very thoughtful document, there are a number of nuances to what it means to talk about precaution that I think we all may not have thoroughly embraced or understood, certainly. They argue that this principle applies when there are considerable uncertainties, scenarios of possible harm that are reasonable, uncertainties that cannot be reduced in the short term, and where the potential harm is sufficiently serious uh, to, to warrant this kind of treatment. And there also uh, would need to be a need to act now. And so I think these conditions are met by this work that we're talking about. And here's one of the other interesting comments they make, as well as many comments about how to undertake the, the, the purpose behind this principle. They suggest, this is UNESCO, be more realistic about the role and potential of science in assessment of complex risks. Precaution entails a greater degree of humility or realism over the role and potential of science in assessment of risks. And they say, scientific analysis is seen as a necessary but not a sufficient basis for effective policy choices. I would just argue that there may be a number of important things that we can do um, because of the guidance given by the precautionary principle that do involve science. Uncertainty analysis, vulnerability science, much more extensive environmental monitoring, but there are things we, we cannot and should not expect from uh, the kind of traditional cost-benefit or risk-benefit analysis with quantitative numbers um, that, that we sometimes think we might be able to achieve here. So um, we need to be talking about kinds of expertise that don't exist typically within, certainly, the infectious disease communities, um, and I think can be found very productively in other areas of uh, the social sciences and national science, natural sciences as well. So my last slide, how to move forward. Um, I think we need, again, as others have said, narrow and specific definitions of what we're concerned about. We, sh I think, need to come to some agreement, if we can, as to whether there are, and if so, what experiments that will not be funded, and morally should not be undertaken for now. I think these are very few and far between and should not scare us away from, from addressing this question. Uh, we should also give guidance to those experiments that others might view as very closely related, but we think are okay, should be funded, um, perhaps under uh, certain degrees of oversight. But we need to be giving positive messages as well as negative messages. We need standardized reviews, standardized assessment approaches, flexible mechanisms. We need democratic, deliberative, and iterative processes, and neutral sponsors and hosts. And finally, as others have already said, this must be international, it must be collaborative. I'm heartened by the efforts of the Inter uh, Academies process panel, um, as well as UNESCO in this particular case, and there may be others. So, um, I'm not sure that the old Asilomar works today, but the principles and ideas that lay behind it certainly were very valuable and, and ought to be thought about as we talk about our paths forward. So thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, let me invite you to please uh, join me. Uh, let me invite uh, Rob Webster, our commentator, and Yoshi, if you'd also uh, rejoin us here uh, on the panel, it would be, uh, it would be great. Rob, we're going to have an opportunity to turn first uh, to you for your reflections on the topic and on the uh, perspectives that we heard respectively from Yoshi and David. Good morning. Good morning and welcome. And <clears throat> Harvey, you're going to have to keep me on target so that I uh, don't drift into too far into tomorrow or this afternoon's topics. So. Uh, let me begin by uh, introducing myself a little. I've spent 50 plus years working on influenza and have seen both sides of what we've heard about this morning with these two disparate uh, opinions of the way forward with the gain of function. Um, after hearing each of their uh, responses, 
I'm not too sure that they're so far apart. They really, uh, may, maybe we could, uh, before we go there, I have to uh, be perfectly honest and, and uh, consider what nature is doing to us right now. I heard this morning that the dreaded H5N1 genes have finally come to United States in the form of H5N8. So the virus is here. And so nature keeps doing things to us. And so we, we've got to be able to look into and make predictions about vaccines and antivirals. Um, so for uh, David and Yoshi, we've heard that uh, it would be desirable to change the, uh, the terminology from gain of function to something else. Is there a something else? I know that Yoshi has already uh, modified his to uh, gain of function of concern, but that acronym is a little bit uh, of concern too. So uh, <laughs> Maybe you, we should uh, address this question that was raised multiple times this morning, is that the gain of function. The gain of function in the public domain, too much has been associated with doomsday scenarios. And, and so I, I think we need to think about this gain of function. What gain of function, is there another term that's better? David, would you like to begin? Thanks, Rob. Uh, well, I think we could start with, uh, with some phrases or descriptors that we might agree upon that, that pertain or, or characterize what it is that we're, we are concerned about or want to talk about or perhaps um, uh, suggest ought not to be undertaken. As far as a, a, a catchy label, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, whether we can or should be worried too much about that right now. Some have suggested maybe, um, well, actually some in this room have suggested that we could be talking about the deliberate creation of infectious agents that are, uh, that are especially dangerous. But to, to whom and, and what these words mean, again, will beg further questions. I'm not sure this is a, a, a you know, a, a great goal for right now. I think we have to educate the public, and that's one of the uh, missions of the, this meeting is to have an open discussion on gain of function. And so, Yoshi, do you have an alternative, or will you <coughs> stay with uh, gain of function concern? Well, I'm not sure about the terminology. Um, Paul Dupre suggested some other um, terminology. But I, I agree with David that uh, we should define specific experiments. I think that's the key. Rob, could I uh, uh, mention, in Kanta's remarks this morning, uh, she offered uh, a kind of acronym, uh, you know, the ATRIP, but the key of it to me was that uh, she was focusing on four attributes, uh, uh, transmissibility, uh, resistance, uh, the idea of uh, infectivity uh, and pathogenicity. Uh, so she was trying to characterize attributes. What David and Yoshi, I think, have added in a way and uh, is the feature of intentional manipulation to achieve these goals outside of what happens in nature. And I think that's a, a very interesting uh, aspect of what we're talking about is, is that what is uh, specifically producing concern. Uh, and uh, I believe both of you in your comments point to that. I, I would agree. The, the, uh, I was also drawn to Kanta's uh, def redefinition mm. of gain of function. This is also in the MBio uh, articles that came out on Friday evening. Um, and uh, I, I think this should receive very serious consideration. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the public need to hear more from us in this area. And, and uh, they, they have to be reassured uh, of risk and the benefits. Uh, 
And uh, David raised the moral and ethical principles which we're all in agreement to, the betterment of mankind, and we're all heading in that direction. I have some specific uh, kinds of questions to ask both of you. And as we move further and further into the genomics era, should we release the sequence of potentially pandemic pathogens? Yoshi. So that actually is the exact, exact issue that uh, this 2011-2012 H5N1 transmission studies. So the, um, there are a lot, many uh, discussions about it. <clears throat> and at the end, at the, at the moment, there's no uh, mechanisms to uh, provide that sequence, specific sequence to a certain group um, and so, so that is why eventually the you know, paper has been published. So unless we find a mechanism to restrict and keep information in certain group, it will be difficult to uh, use that information in a useful way. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, and I think it, 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 the, the answer to your question depends a little upon the circumstance. It, if uh, sequences have been generated from naturally occurring isolates that have occurred in nature, um, I guess that's what natural occurring means, um, then of course, yes, I think we have a moral obligation to, to share both reagents and information that, that comes directly from nature. Um, if the question really has to do with should we generate new uh, sequence information from organisms that were deliberately created to have this combination of properties that renders them unusually dangerous to humans, environment, et cetera, then I'd, I'd back up and say, I wouldn't un necessarily undertake those experiments that would be designed to generate those data. I think we're going to hear this afternoon about uh, the, the wisdom of China releasing the sequence of the H7N9 transmissible virus and the rapid use of that information <coughs> for the whole, for universal uh, production of vaccines and oh. uh, so. Uh, Rob, could I ask David a, a question? Because today, David, you've really stressed the idea of the <coughs> danger of the combination of uh, creating in the laboratory an agent that's simultaneously transmissible, highly pathogenic, and resistant. Uh, so that's a kind of extreme straw man. But come back to the particular case where all you're doing is working on transmissibility, which in fact relates to the recent studies. Does your conclusion stop short of transmissibility alone? So I think what would concern me and I think others is the creation, the deliberate creation of something that, that now has all of these properties, especially when that combination has not previously existed. So I'm not concerned, for example, about the deliberate um, creation or enhancement of one of those properties in an agent that doesn't have the others, uh, giving PR8 uh, the ability to replicate more easily or, uh, or change its, its um, host cell tropism or host species tropism, by itself that doesn't concern me at all. Um, and that's why I think this broad term of gain of function do is not, doesn't capture or doesn't specify really what it is we're most concerned about. Uh, because of its, its breadth of coverage. So, so David, you are not concerned about the uh, H5N1 virus transmission studies because it, they are all sensitive to available uh, influenza drugs. No, no, so that's not, that's not correct. I, I gave that as one example in, in the case of, uh, actually in the case of any agent that we couldn't easily contain at wherever the site of its creation, I'd be concerned about the, the, the deliberate creation of an agent that was simply highly pathogenic and highly transmissible. Rob, back to you. Back to me. Uh, in the influenza field, the goal is to predict. 
which of the multi multitude of influenza viruses that are out there in nature, which ones have pandemic potential? It's similar to weather forecasting. And I look back 10 years ago, weather forecasting was abysmal. I look what happens now, weather forecasting can be precise. And looking to the future, this is what is we, we, the potential for influenza. We are able to predict which of those influenza viruses and which birds have the potential to go to humans. Can we achieve this kind of information without the gain of function of concern studies? Yoshi. Well, <clears throat> that I, I think we should um, recognize that um, we need to uh, know a lot more. Uh, we just begin to learn what's involved in the um, airborne transmissibility. We, we learned, in addition to the receptor recognition and uh, replication at lower temperature and also in mammalian host, we just learned this, the HS stability, another trait. We don't know whether that's all we needed. Um, so we, we still need to uh, learn a lot more to really predict what is the, um, the viruses that acquire transmissibility in, in, in nature. I, I completely agree. I completely agree wholeheartedly. I, I think the only issue is simply what are the, the particular kinds of experiments that are undertaken to gain this critical information. Rob, could I uh, pose a question to each of our uh, panelists? And then I do want to open up also for comments or questions from, from the audience. Um, let, me, let me turn, uh, David, to you, because Yoshi made a particular point about uh, the value for decision making, for example, about vaccine stockpiling that came specifically from the fact of demonstration that it was possible to have mammalian transmission with H5N1, which prior to the demonstrations that uh, Ron Fouchier and Yoshi's labs accomplished was a matter of very serious debate. Uh, would you acknowledge that that result itself uh, had a value and a consequence of, uh, of, that, uh, of that merit? So it's a very interesting question. Um, I would argue first that everything I saw and others saw about H5N1 due to the wonderful work of both of these folks prior to those experiments should have motivated us and the world community to undertake a serious effort to prepare in the form of vaccine preparation stockpiling and the public health infrastructure to deliver it, which we don't necessarily have right now, um, at least in a timely manner. Um, second, did, that ex did those experiments help? I think, yes, they probably did further motivate um, the, the importance of, again, preparing against this virus, H5N1. I actually found uh, Yoshi's 2012 experiment to be as compelling as Ron Fouchier's experiment. Yoshi undertook his in a, in a different genetic background, deliberately uh, created, it seems, to uh, reduce some of these uh, concerning properties that, that, that would then coexist all on the same agent. I, I think there was value in those, in those experiments, um, as there is in all. But I, I think, A, we already knew enough to be very concerned and, um, and motivated to do something, which, as it seems, we have not yet done. And second, that the incremental motivation um, could be achieved, I think, through experiments that had lesser risks than those that had greater. Thank you. Uh, and Yoshi, could I ask you a question? Because one of the points that you were arguing uh, was that gain-of-function research of concern, as you defined it, also had a particular value with respect to possible strain selection for vaccine. You later pointed out 
that when you take the subset of avian strains, that 100% of the human cases have actually related to a subset, the 70% with a particular mutant profile. My question to you is, wouldn't that natural experiment of what wild type virus is actually succeeding in humans have greater merit for strain selection than a study of transmissibility in ferrets? As I, as I mentioned, the ferret, ferret transmission studies allowed us to identify the specific new phenotype that we didn't realize existed in virus, but we didn't realize until we performed the experiment. And it's very interesting. Ron Fouché and uh, we, our group, did different experiments, came to the same conclusion, different mutation even. But when we actually looked at the sequence mutations, we knew from the very beginning that's a stability issue. So we're talking about new phenotype, new, new um, phenotype trait. So, so that, that is very important because we can now use that trait uh, to screen uh, natural isolates for pandemic potential. Thank you very much. Uh, the floor is open for comments or questions from those here. Hi. Please, again, identify yourself and pose your question or make your comment. Uh, I'm Lori Garrett from the Council on Foreign Relations. We deliberated on this topic for about a year, and uh, at some point later, I'd be happy to share our conclusions, which are markedly different from most of this conversation. But I wanted to I wanted to ask, since we, the, the primary benefit forwarded is a distinctly policy benefit, I want to pose a question both to Harvey and Yoshi, and it's about hubris. In 1976, we had a dominant scientific theory, Rob was there, he knows, that said flu viruses go in cycles. And they're almost predictable cycles. And there will be this moment when, there, it, when the cycle year hits and you will have a pandemic strain come forward. And they will almost always come out of pigs. And a lot of that thinking, which was considered very sophisticated, state-of-the-art scientific thinking in the 1970s, um, guided the swine flu vaccine fiasco. Um, and so, when Yoshi, you suggest that based on this moment's scientific state-of-the-art thinking, something I think if I added your numbers right, around $1.4 billion worth of vaccine purchasing for just two countries, and I assume if we went on a global scale, it would be a much larger number, that that could be guided by one specific set of um, uh, two mutations found in your experiment and Ron Fouché's experiment. And I wonder if we're not once again justifying um, some experimental work based on a pretty high degree of potential hubris, which could lead to a situation where we build stockpiles against exactly the wrong viral strain. Maybe I'll make a very brief comment. Rob, you could also comment on this if you wish. I think one of the uh, enduring challenges in uh, flu epidemiology, influenza virology, relates to the point that uh, Yoshi and others made earlier, which is we have relatively few incidents of global pandemics, and we have a lot of time to think about them. And therefore, it's very easy to gain greater confidence about the meaning of a very small number of observations. That's the epidemiologic observation. To me, that's an added reason why increased scientific data derived from a variety of both observational and interventional laboratory-based studies can help deepen and widen our appreciation of the possibilities. Uh, and identify those elements which may be more predictive. At the same time, I think the caution of not to be overly confident in the, uh, in the conclusions that follow from any one experiment is uh, a very important reminder in the same way that overconfidence from a very small number of epidemiologic observations uh, can uh, lead to a wrong conclusion. 
Do you want to comment on the other yeah. question? And so the, um, I, I think it is important that we don't know, um, anybody uh, don't know which virus will be the next pandemic strain. And in fact, we couldn't, nobody really predicted 2009 pandemic virus. Um, so the next pandemic virus could be H9, H5, H7, H10, we don't know. But among those viruses, H5 may be more uh, pathogenic than others if this uh, cause pandemic. So it's an insurance uh, we, we uh, pay and we, we spend money for. Thank you. Shall we go to the other questions? Robert, do you want to make a comment as well? No, I, I think you've moved to the on. other questions. Okay, we have uh, six uh, questioners who would like to raise a question, and we have about 15 minutes, and there's a uh, comment and question from the uh, webcast, so we'll try to move briskly through uh, everyone to give each an opportunity to make your comment or pose your question, and we'll try to be concise on this end as well. Please. Susan Wolf on NSAB. David, you uh, argued that even careful evaluation of the risks and careful evaluation of the benefits won't be enough because ultimately we have to make value judgments about what risks are responsible to incur for what benefits. So as NSAP thinks about how to structure the risk-benefit analysis and what further work is necessary on top of a risk-benefit analysis in order to fully capture the inputs that are needed to uh, recommend a framework. I'm wondering whether the panelists have recommendations uh, on two scores. One is perhaps on how to structure a more capacious risk-benefit analysis that would capture some of these further considerations. And the second is how to structure the additional analysis that will bring to bear robustly those value considerations. Uh, David, do you want to comment? How, how would you incorporate those broader considerations? It's a great question, Susan. Um, well, first, there, there could be examples from other circumstances where people have had to grapple with um, difficult to quantify, perhaps unusually large potential risks. Um, I don't pretend to be an expert on all of those circumstances. Uh, some lessons have been learned from looking at risks associated with the nuclear power industry. Some lessons have been learned from processes related to how we think about risks associated with, with creation of airplanes and flying. I don't think any of those work exactly for us, but you know, each, I think, has particular pieces of, of useful uh, experience that are worth capturing. There are a number of social scientists, including yourself, who have thought long and hard about how do processes and other examples um, become exploited for, you know, for transference or applicability to a new setting. And I think that's, that's the question you're asking. Um, so lessons from elsewhere. And I think um, a bit more of, a, of an outreach to those who, again, have, um, have looked at these same problems from just different angles as well. Uh, it's a lot of variability within the infectious disease community that hasn't been fully captured. Um, and likewise, other kinds of sciences. Thank you very much. Morning, I'm Gerald Epstein with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, and David, I'm gonna pick on you as well. I appreciated your crystallizing, really a, one of the very important questions is as, are there experiments which we shouldn't do? And I wanna offer a further potential sharpening which you may have thought was implicit, but I think we should make explicit. And I would say, are there scientifically meritorious experiments that we shouldn't do? And I bring that up because when NIH held its public forum on its gain of function or its pathogen, uh, its framework in November 2012, a panel was given a number of possible case studies for people from a very diverse range of backgrounds to say, well, should we do this or should we not do this? And I was surprised that the panel was nearly or completely unanimous in one case that we should not do it. Some of them said the risks posed were too high, and others of them said, no, that's just bad science. We shouldn't do that because it's bad science. So I think your question is more salient if we, if we say, oh, is there experiments which you can argue a scientific case for, which would pass our merit review, but which we still shouldn't do? Yeah, and so my answer would be yes. Um, I think there are experiments that would yield interesting 
um, information that, that may have some value. And I, I mean, all experiments have some value, of course. Uh, but I, I do think there are experiments that might fail on the appropriateness and prudence um, question and, and magnitude of risk. Um, we, I, I believe, for example, may find reason to say we need to understand whether Ebola virus is able to be much more easily transmitted by airborne route between humans. This question has been raised. Um, should we undertake, therefore, a deliberate effort to generate uh, either generate large amounts of diversity in Ebola virus in the laboratory and then select for this property of this possible you know, acquisition of uh, respiratory transmissibility? No, I, I wouldn't do that, not because the result might not have some interesting value for understanding filoviruses, but rather I just think it's an inappropriate experiment because of the risks that are, that are entailed. Now, this may happen in nature, it may not, but I think there are other ways of addressing that important question, other experimental approaches than that deliberate creation of that property in a highly virulent naturally, natural isolate, for which, again, we don't have good countermeasures. Thank you. I'm Turkan Gardner. Uh, there was mention of digitalization of Silicon Valley and new technologies. And I'm wondering if whether or how far we can go in applying simulation analysis and created prospective scenarios in weighing risks and benefits, or are we going to be going too far looking into the crystal ball, getting away from the laboratory aspects of risk-benefit analyses? Is your question directed to uh, the use of simulation and modeling in the conduct of the benefit-risk analysis, right. per se? Uh, I, I think that, uh, does anyone want to comment on that? Because I think that's something we're going to come to also in our discussion of, the, uh, of how to do the benefit-risk analysis itself. So let's keep that as a reminder of an important uh, aspect of that, uh, if I may. And okay. thank, you. thank you. Please. Uh, Harold Jaffe from CDC. There's kind of a framing question that's been alluded to, but I don't think has been said very clearly or maybe needs some clarification, which is what's really the public health benefit of this research? And more specifically, what are we doing differently in public health based on the results? So using the H5N1 example, we know it's transmitted from animals to people, and we know in very limited circumstances it's transmitted from one person to another. So we know all that. What our how does our response differ knowing that plus having these experiments versus just knowing that? Yoshi, do you want to comment? Right. So uh, that's what I, I was trying to explain in my presentation. First, it is important that we need to continue to uh, continue stockpiling. That's the information that we learned from this inf uh, experiment. Second, identifying specific strains. With what kind of viruses are more uh, more transmissible, to become transmissible in, possibly in humans. Um, so those are the issues that, you know, the, this experiment provided with, a, a, you know, as additional information. Thank you. Um, Mike Imperiali, University of Michigan. So um, someone raised this new nomenclature again. I just wanted to come back to that. And I, I commend Paul Dupre and Arturo Casadeval for trying to, you know, pull in the reins on gain of function, but I think, this A-trip really doesn't solve the bigger issue, which is that there are going to be experiments that fall under that definition that we're not really going to be worried about. And, and again, while we can make those distinctions here, I don't think that people outside our communities can, can make those decisions. And so I think we, we need to think about that a little bit more carefully. Well, thank you for the comment. Uh, I, I would uh, just uh, make an observation that regardless of how refined a definition could become, it would always be a threshold for a question of, of examination at another level. I think that's the aspiration that one would have in trying to define any of the categories we're discussing. Not that it gives you the definitive answer on any one experiment, but it is the trigger for a deeper assessment in certain instances. That, that I think, is the aspiration out of this kind of classification scheme or alternative schemes that we're deliberating on. Please. 
Hi, Adolfo García Sastre. Uh, I think it's clear that what we are concerned about is making highly pathogenic viruses transmissible and what could be the consequences then of that. And I just want to point out again to something that has been brought before. We've developed a technique that allows attenuation of pathogenicity and transmission of highly pathogenic transmissible viruses in ferrets for humans. So there is now a mean how to make these experiments in ferrets using a backbone, which is this macroRNA targeted sequence viruses, that makes them the viruses attenuated in humans. And this technique is only possible because of the discovery of what the macroRNAs are doing. So I think while science advance, we need to keep in mind also in the future that potential experiments that cannot be done right now may be able to be done by doing some biocontainment similar to the one that I'm describing. And just a comment that right now we can actually do experiments if, 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 we, if it's decided at the end to do these experiments that minimize the risk in humans because of the inclusion of attenuation markers for humans, specific for humans. Very good. Thank you so much for the comment. Uh, I would uh, just like to mention, if I may, one uh, question, really a comment that's come in from the, uh, from the webcast, and it, in a way it also relates to considerations that ought to enter into the full risk-benefit assessment. It's a questioner who's posing uh, the question of how do you take account of, uh, if you will, uh, risks from natural disasters, uh, earthquakes, tornadoes, uh, tsunamis that can disrupt the integrity of, uh, of laboratories or other uh, centers which in the normal course of events uh, are not subject to the same stresses from the physical environment. So I don't know that that requires a comment from the panel, but it's another consideration that we'll want to incorporate. Rob, do you want to make any final observation before we conclude? No, I, I think... Uh We've come to uh, more consensus than I uh, had hoped in the beginning, and um, the more we can work towards a common goal of um, doing no harm, as David's mantra says, and as Yoshi's says, to make vaccines for the whole world, more successful vaccines. Maybe on that note, I would like to ask the, uh, the holy grail at the moment of influenzaology is the universal vaccine. The universal vaccine would help answer many of these problems. Will the gain of function, restrictions on gain of function, alter our ability to develop this goal of the universal vaccine? David, would you like to? Uh... I'm, as you know, I'm not an influenza virologist. Uh, I certainly would hope not, and certainly as well expect not, that if we can, in fact, this might be uh, an important uh, metric against which we make these efforts to refine and specify what it is we're concerned about, that it not encroach upon all the good work that would go towards that effort. Yoshi, do you want to make any comment? Well, um, I, I think we should also realize that it, it takes time for developing new vaccines. The um, Massav identified this called adaptive strain. It took 20 years for that virus to become useful in vaccines. So we have to be careful about timing, too. Can I just add that, that just again to point out that if one talks about undertaking an experiment that has a particularly large risk that we all um, assume today with the, with the publication of the information, then I think we have to think much harder and, again, hold ourselves to a higher standard of, of when uh, we are going to realize the benefits that come from this experiment and whether it will, the benefits will be equally distributed across all citizens of the world if we're talking about something that is highly, highly transmissible. Well, please join me in thanking Yoshi, David, and Rob for a really excellent discussion. Thank you. Uh, we're now scheduled to take a half-hour break, and we will